Hi everyone, I'm Greg Watson from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. In this module I'm going to be talking about continuous integration and how it can be used in the development process for scientific computing. This is the um, licensing and acknowledgements uh, slide. Uh, the only thing I think of note here is the citation if you want to cite this work. So what is continuous integration? Well, uh, when people are using uh, distributed uh, version control systems such as Git, uh, a, a typical workflow consists of creating a new branch of a particular repository. So essentially that means making a copy of the code um, and making some changes to that code. Um, once those changes have been completed, the, those changes are typically reviewed in some way um, and there's an approval process and then the changes are merged back into the main repository. Um, now, uh, continuous integration fits in between the point where the, the changes are being made to the code and the review happens prior to it being merged back in. And typically uh, what that, that process is is a cycle of running a series of tests against that code um, to make sure that um, the code itself is functioning properly and it hasn't made any um, breaking changes to the rest of the code. Um, and uh, the, once those, uh, those tests have been run and they're successful, then the code can be moved to the next phase, which is a review process. Now that integration, continuous integration process may be very iterative. The tests may not pass the first time. And so the developer may need to go back, um, make some changes, rerun the test, make some more changes and so forth. Um, so it becomes a very iterative process. Um, but uh, essentially the, the continuous integration component that we're gonna talk about today is really this piece that fits in uh, to that part of the development workflow. So what are the main components of continuous integration? Well, there's three primary components. Um, the first and probably the most important is testing. Uh, tests are really what drive continuous integration. Um, and there are some requirements on the tests. Uh, in particular, the tests themselves uh, need to cover uh, as much code as possible. Um, and they also need to be fast uh, because they're going to be part of a um, iterative development cycle. And if the tests take a long time to run, then um, that's not really going to be very optimal for the developers. Um, the upshot of that is that existing test suites on, on projects that are not using continuous integration um, may require redesign or refactoring at least um, in order to be able to be effectively used with continuous integration. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, the second aspect is the integration itself. And the goal here is that uh, changes that are made to the code um, get integrated, but only uh, as long as they're not going to break the whole code base. And so we want to promote integration and getting changes into the code as, as often as possible but we want to make sure that everything is still working. And so sort of the traditional development um, life cycle of you know, developing a lot of code um, and making a lot of changes and then doing large merges um, and then uh, subsequently testing those changes uh, either through an automated or a manual testing process are not really compatible with continuous integration. Continuous integration is meant to be a much more iterative um, process where we develop a little bit of code, we test that code to make sure that it's not breaking the, the functionality of the code base, and then we merge that in, and then we develop more and we test more and, and so forth. So it's a very iterative uh, process. And the continuous uh, aspect of it is that we really want to um, uh, test every time we do a commit, um, or we indicate that we want the code to be included into the code base, um, we do the integration test and the testing at that point. 
Um, and so it's continuous it's happening all the time um, as part of the development uh, workflow. So in, in general, uh, continuous integration really implies a lot of automation. Uh, things have to happen automatically um, as part of the development process. So hopefully by this point you took the module on uh, introduction to testing so you're familiar with test-driven development. So how do these concepts relate? How does test-driven development relate to automated testing uh, and that uh, relate to continuous integration? Well, test-driven development is, is really a methodology um, where the functional tests are written uh, before the code. And this works really well in the continuous integration context, context because um, if you write the tests and you commit those, that will trigger the uh, continuous integration, which will then automatically run and fail because you haven't actually written the code. You can then write the code that implements that functionality, which re-triggers the test. And, um, and then that, those changes, assuming the test pass at that point, those changes get merged uh, into the code base. So it does fit very well with that methodology. Um, automated testing uh, is something that a lot of projects use. Um, and these are this, automated testing is essentially where you're running tests on a regular basis um, in order to uh, detect anomalous behaviors or um, incorrect results and so forth. Um, typically, automated testing happens on um, a, a larger, longer time scale, uh, usually nightly, um, and then the re results of those tests are reported uh, using some kind of monitoring system. And that's not normally part of your development workflow. It usually sits alongside your development workflow. It happens separately from the development that you're doing. Um, and so there's some issues uh, that, that, can, that can arise uh, with with automated testing, you you have to you know regularly check the results. Um, maybe there's some kind of notification through email or some other mechanism, but even so, you still the developer still is required to check those results and then go back and and fix up any problems that occur, which may be some time after the changes were made. Um, continuous inter integration, as I've as I've mentioned. Um, you're performing uh, the testing, essentially automated testing, but at a very high frequency and a fine granularity. Um, and the, the aim is to really prevent any code changes from getting into the code base before um, you, know, those, uh, you know, those code changes are merged and break the, uh, break the code that's in the, in the code base. Um, the other difference is that, that continuous integration is part of your development workflow and is very integrated into it. Um, it has some issues. Um, it requires a lot of automation. The tests are very important um, and need to uh, be, be carefully considered. Um, you need to make sure that the test coverage is very good um, uh, for, for various reasons, which I'll go into uh, shortly. And also your you're going to need to uh, rely on some kind of third-party services or resources uh, typically to help you run those tests and, and manage the tests. So here's a couple of examples. Um, on the left is an automated nightly uh, testing dashboard. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in this case, you know, the tests are run um, uh, presumably on a nightly basis. It tells you which tests have run successfully, which tests have had uh, some issues uh, and tests that have failed. And then it's really up to the developer to, to uh, monitor that and then take action when they discover that there's some issues. On the right uh, is a, a continuous integration testing framework that's integrated with your development workflow and you can't actually proceed in your workflow until you've addressed the issues um, that are flagged um, as part of the continuous integration process. So it provides much tighter integration. So some issues to uh, consider when you're um, thinking about continuous integration. So if you're just getting started, um, there's a lot of choice out there. There's a lot of different technologies available for continuous integration. 
a lot of them are cloud based. Um, so, you know, just navigating through all that and trying to figure out what the best thing to use can be a challenge. Um, another issue are, are the tests themselves. Um, and what you'll find is that uh, existing tests that are, have been developed for a, a non continuous integration environment typically won't really work well with continuous integration. Uh, usually they're too complex, uh, they're going to take too long to run. Um, and so you really have to balance this notion of, of thoroughness of the tests, but with responsiveness because the tests are going to be run really frequently as part of the, the workflow. Um, so you know, uh, often you're going to have to refactor those or uh, rewrite those tests uh, so that they work well with a continuous integration. And then the coverage itself is, is really important because um, if, you, uh, if there's code that's not being tested, um, you can get a false sense of security. The test, the continuous integration runs and says that everything is fine, uh, but if you're not actually adequately testing the code, then you might be introducing uh, bugs into the code, but thinking that everything is okay. Um, so there are, you know, there's some issues associated with that that really need to be well thought through. There's some situations which are um, uh, not compatible or maybe difficult to be compatible with continuous integration or make it more difficult, um, such as when you've got lots of uh, different hardware configurations um, which can create inconsistent uh, types of failures. Um, and those can be uh, you know, difficult to address either with automated testing, um, but also with uh, continuous integration. Um, there's some approaches to dealing with these issues where you're using relative tolerances uh, rather than trying to do bit for bit exact matching and so forth that um, uh, you, know, you can look into to try and address those. There's uh, another situation where there's um, a lot of third party libraries involved that uh, can make compiling and building the code just to get to a point where you want to test it. Uh, that can take a long time and that can interfere with the uh, responsiveness of the continuous integration testing. So um, you can look at approaches of caching, uh, pre-built libraries and so forth or using uh, uh, some sort of container technology to try and alleviate some of those problems. And then there's other uh, testing approaches such as performance testing uh, where um, you uh, require you know, significant resources um, or uh, different kinds of resources that may not be easily available uh, through the uh, traditional continuous integration uh, testing resources available. So that can also introduce some challenges. Okay, so um, the resources that you use for continuous integration are, are pretty important. Um, in other words, where do these jobs run? Where do you run the tests um, to, uh, to make sure that um, the code is correct? So there's a few different options. Um, many of the, um, of the web-based platforms uh, such as GitHub and Bitbucket and GitLab and so forth uh, provide uh, f free resources. Um, these are typically shared with other users so you don't get exclusive access to them um, but you can you can use them for free. Um, there's also some free tiers on Amazon and um, other uh, cloud-based uh, uh, providers that you can utilize. Um, but in all these situations, all these free resources are typically virtual machines um, which gives you some flexibility in terms of uh, which uh, operating systems you might want to utilize. But typically they're constrained in many ways. Um, they might be constrained on uh, the size of the memory, the type of the hardware that you can utilize and so forth. So um, these may be adequate for uh, simple testing um, or simple applications, but with when you're getting into scientific codes and high performance computing, um, they're probably not going to be adequate. You might need to turn to uh, site uh, local resources where um, a particular organization or subgroup within that organization provides you know, more uh, 
complete or comprehensive resources for, for testing. Um, and many organisations do this. Um, so uh, the national labs in particular uh, pretty much all have continuous in integration infrastructure that you can utilise. Um, the Exascale Computing Program is also uh, working with those uh, laboratories to extend CI infrastructure to, you know, uh, the significant um, uh, uh, leadership facilities um, and larger uh, HPC systems um, in order for them to be utilised for continuous integration. The third approach is to uh, set up your own resources and this is definitely an option um, if the other options are not working for you you can provide your own hardware um, or you could uh, pay for uh, resources through uh, cloud providers and so forth uh, but obviously they're not going to be free and so uh, there's going to be some uh, resource cost associated with that so just a an example of this, um, so perhaps you're using GitHub, um, which is a, a you know a, a web-based um, platform for hosting the source code, um, and your uh, CI resources are utilizing Amazon, um, and GitHub provides very close integration to, to be able to do that. Um, you might also be uh, utilizing some local uh, resources. Uh, either to do some kind of uh, CI or really just for your own manual um, execution of those codes. And then there are other cloud-based uh, uh, services available such as codecov.io, which can be utilized by, um, by your uh, uh, web-based platforms hosting the code. So how do you go about getting started with continuous integration? Well, the first thing you need to think about is uh, what uh, configuration you're likely to need in order to build and execute your code. Um, so things like what compilers, uh, what languages you want to use, um, what programming libraries and programming models uh, you're likely to uh, be uh, utilizing in your code. Um, because that's going to uh, be something that you, you need to address up front in order to be able to get your code to build. Uh, the functionality of your code is also important and, they, and that's a good thing to think about too. Um, do you need GPUs? You know, are you going to be running uh, using a particular programming model and so forth? Because again, uh, that's going to influence what resources you're likely to need to be able to build and, and run your tests. Um, and then getting started, a, a very you know, good way to, to uh, start that process is to, to begin with a Hello World example. Um, just a very, very trivial uh, piece of code. Get that set up in the repository um, and create a, um, a continuous integration uh, workflow that will build and test that, that very simple code. Um, once you've got that working, you can uh, think about the configuration and functionality aspects and what sort of resources that you're going to need. If that is going to mean that you'll need more than just a free, uh, you know, shared resources provided by some of these cloud services, then you'll have to look into what your uh, site provides um, or you might need to, you know, uh, look at look at what the Exascale Computing Project is doing, or you know other other things like that. If you think you're going to need um, more significant resources, so um, setting up continuous integration is pretty straightforward, um, and is fairly similar uh, for all the different uh, web platforms. Um, there's a, there's some uh, you know differences in terminology and different uh, different ways of doing things, uh, but ultimately you're pretty much doing the same thing. Um, so the the two most common GitHub and GitLab, um, these are driven through uh, YAML. And for people that aren't familiar with YAML, it's a it's really a text based uh, structured uh, format uh, for configuration files and uh, 
GitHub has this thing called actions uh, where you define workflows uh, in these YAML files. Um, GitLab uses a single YAML file that's stored in the, um, the root of the repository. Um, and the syntax is slightly different uh, for the, the two different platforms, but uh, ultimately, um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a very similar process. So this just is an example of a GitHub's action file, and I'll go into more detail about the different sections and so forth. But you can see that the format is fairly straightforward, and um, and these are quite easy to write and and manage, uh, and they're kept in the repository themselves. So you do have version controlling of these as well. Um, for GitHub, once you've uh, written one of these action uh, files, then it appears automatically in the user interface of, of GitHub. And you can use that user interface to, to manually execute the workflows. You can see the status of the workflow and which steps have been executed and so forth. Now, in this case, we've created a workflow that um, actually runs some code coverage tools and then uploads those uh, the code coverage information to codecub.io so then you can get a visualization of how the uh, tests are um, you know what what code has been covered by the tests that you uh, you've written for your code um, <clears throat> again you know, github in this case um, provides uh, uh, an indication on the user interface of uh, the results of the of the integration uh, workflow runs. So each time the tests are run, uh, you get a um, an entry in a table like this, and you can see uh, it annotates those with uh, various icons to indicate whether the tests were successful or whether they failed. And so this gives you immediate feedback on uh, the success or otherwise of of your tests. In addition, uh, GitHub annotates the, uh, the pull requests that um, initiated the, the workflow. And for those who are not familiar, a pull request um, on GitHub is essentially um, a way of taking a commit to your local, that, that you've made in your local repository and, and, and uh, packaging that up in a way that uh, can be uh, looked at by other people um, you know, approved and so forth uh, before it's it's actually merged into the the main repository. So a pull a pull request essentially in, encapsulates those those changes, and those pull requests are used uh, by GitHub to trigger the continuous integration um, workflow, and then the the pull requests themselves get annotated um, again with icons that indicate whether the the test ran successfully or not. And so the developer can then go in and uh, make changes to uh, and, and do additional commits and so forth um, in order to fix up whatever the problems were. So what does an action look like in a little bit more detail? Um, so, uh, and again, this is specific to GitHub. If you do this on GitLab, it's gonna look slightly different. Um, but, you know, the concepts are essentially pretty similar. So you, the, the first line really just defines a name for the action, and that's going to be displayed in the user interface. Um, the next section de defines what triggers the, the workflow to run. And there's a, a whole variety of different triggers. In this case, we're triggering on pushes to the main branch. And also, uh, if you create a pull request against the main branch, it will also trigger this workflow. Um, you can also, um, with GitHub Actions, create manual triggers. So, for example, if you wanted to run this workflow, but you want to run it against a different uh, Git uh, commit, um, then you can add a workflow dispatch, a dispatch um, uh, entry like this, which will put a button and some user interface elements that allow you to manually run the, the workflow and provide additional information. Um, the next section uh, describes the, the workflow itself. Um, there is a, there's a build step which essentially uh, tells the workflow how to build the code. Uh, 
And obviously building requires a lot of different um, prerequisites, um, things like what operating system do you want to use, uh, what versions of Python and so forth. And uh, one of the nice things about GitHub Actions is you can actually create a, a matrix of these things. So you can do sort of a combinatorial um, a version of all the tests to make sure that, you know, different versions of, of languages work with different operating systems and so forth. Um, and that uh, can be uh, done automatically as part of the, of the workflow. Uh, the last part of the workflow defines the actual steps uh, that are taken to, to run the tests. Um, these don't actually have to be tests, but you know normally they would be. Um, but they can combine things like um, checking out uh, source code, uh, running scripts, and doing other things. And you can see here we have a, a, a job script that um, does a variety of diff different things just using a, um, a shell script. But you can run other types of scripts. Um, there are also predefined actions that you can you can utilize as well. So it's a very rich uh, set of things that you can do within uh, the, the workflow steps. So once we have continuous integration set up for our and incorporated into our development life cycle, we can think about how we might want to utilize the same sort of processes in a broader context. So for example, we can introduce something like a image repository where the results of uh, the continuous integration build uh, is, uh, is cached. And then those uh, images can be utilized to implement something like a continuous delivery mechanism where uh, the images are deployed to some kind of uh, cloud-based services or some other kind of service. So we can incorporate multiple loops here uh, within the, the full development and release lifecycle. So this, this continuous integration process and architecture is something that we can really expand on and use for other purposes in addition to just purely testing and checking code before it's, it's uh, incorporated into the repository. So to summarize, um, the purpose of continuous integration is to really identify problems very early um, and prevent code that would potentially break uh, the, the build um, or ad adversely impact other developers from being introduced into the code base in the first place. Um, the important thing is though, it needs to be, uh, everyone needs to have confidence that that's the case, right? So you have to balance um, the level of testing you do by uh, the speed of the tests. Um, CI typically complements uh, extensive automated testing, doesn't usually replace it, um, but it's just another thing that you can use to improve your code quality. CI for test-driven development is a very natural fit. Um, writing the test before the code works well in the CI environment. And um, there are many options for where to execute tests. That's probably the most compl complicated part of setting up continuous integration. So you can go free, but that may not be sufficient if you're looking at HPC or scientific codes. But the key thing here is start simple, get the automation working, and then build out um, your integration, your continuous integration environment um, as you go, um, making sure your tests expand to cover the new code. And the best way to do that is using test-driven development.